The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Mapping the Optimal Treatment Route in HCC, Identifying Best Practices in an Expanding Therapeutic Landscape. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash VMC 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So, you know, liver cancer globally is a serious problem. And in the United States, while we've made a lot of progress in treating many malignancies and, and we've seen decreasing death rates for many cancers, really liver cancer is one of the few malignancies that is rising in death rates. And I think we'll see this change in the next decade as we start to incorporate some of our advances and hopefully there'll be more to come. But still, this highlights the unmet medical needs for our patients. And I like to remind everybody that, you know, liver cancer is curable. And it's curable when it's found early. And to find it early, you need to look for liver disease, which is really not happening enough, I think, in primary care. And for patients who have liver disease, you need to look for liver cancer. So when we approach patients with liver cancer, and in other malignancies, they're staged. We stage patients so we have an idea of prognosis, so we have an idea of what treatments are appropriate for that patient with that particular stage. And it also allows us to compare data from one publication to another, from one trial to another, to compare uh, the population that's been accrued because staging is prognostic. In liver cancer staging, unlike other malignancies, which are based on TNM, which are concentrate just on tumor characteristics, because of the association of liver cancer with underlying liver disease, it's critical that we take into account the patient's uh, comorbidity of cirrhosis. And that is where the BCLC really was grounded. Uh, and you know, many of you are familiar with this, and, and this comes from a publication that updated it a little bit, but needless to say, on one extreme, we have patients who have very bad liver disease, very decompensated, regardless of their tumor burden, really supportive care is appropriate, with the caveat that some patients could still be transplanted, even if they have a sick liver, if their tumor burden is low. On the other extreme, we have patients who have well-compensated liver disease, small tumors, are surgical candidates, not as much in the United States, where most of our liver disease is from viral hepatitis or NASH, but certainly we do see patients who are found early uh, and, and can go for curative resection or curative ablation, or patients who might get ablation as a bridge to transplant. The majority of patients we see are unresectable, and they're unresectable in the intermediate stage or the advanced stage. Advanced liver cancer is characterized by patients who have disease outside their liver, but also, and this is an important point, patients who have vascular invasion. So you do an MRI and you see tumor invading into the vasculature, the hepatic uh, uh, or portal vein or branch thereof, those patients are advanced. And the intermediate group are those patients who are well compensated, have multifocal tumor in their liver, and no extrahepatic spread and no vascular invasion. And historically, for this group, chemoembolization and local regional treatments are the backbone. And for the advanced stage C, we're talking systemic treatment. Now, in this uh, um, update to the BCLC, which is in press right now, they've recognized that the intermediate group is actually a heterogeneous group of patients. Some of these patients will be downstaged from intermediate and be candidates for transplant. Others will get local regional treatment as their definitive management, which has been shown to improve survival. But some patients with intermediate disease are candidates for systemic treatment out of the gate. And even though they have tumor confined to the liver, they have characteristics that make local regional treatments unfavorable or to give unfavorable results. That is patients who have very large tumors, diffuse infiltrative tumors, uh, or have symptoms from their disease. So, you know, there's been some progress of recent, which we're going to talk about. 
but it also has raised uh, some new questions for us. So, as many of you are aware, the first drug approved in liver cancer was in 2008, was the multi-kinase inhibitor serafinib. This was a big step forward in that we had a systemic treatment that could improve overall survival. It left us needing better treatments. The response rate with serafinib was close to zero, single digit. It improved survival, ultimately the most important endpoint in any cancer study. However, quality of life issues certainly need to be considered as the drug has some well-known toxicities, hand, foot, skin syndrome, GI toxicity, fatigue, anorexia. And, you know, I'm a little older than my colleagues here, uh, but I remember when we had nothing for liver cancer and serafinib was a big step forward and it also opened up the door to a lot of research. And I was asked in 2008, wow, we have serafinib, what's going to happen in the next five years? Oh, there's going to be all these drugs approved, it's the golden age. And as you know, for the next 10 years, we had nothing. And really now, in the last four or five years, we've had an explosion of new drugs. So, you know, data even from the last three, four years showed that serafinib was still the most common frontline option, uh, even though in 2017, 2018, lenvantinib got approved. And then just, and again, with corona, all the years are, are mixing up now, but uh, in 2020, uh, May 2020, June 2020, atezobev was approved based on the Embrave 150 study. And I think that has really set a new standard of care for frontline liver cancer. But not every patient may be a candidate for that. And as we're learning in the past several months, we'll see that there are new doublets that are validating the importance of immuno-oncology agents in liver cancer. And Dr. Borad will talk about some of these new emerging practice changing data. The other thing to keep in mind is we have a number of drugs that have been shown to improve survival, and they've been shown to improve survival when they're used sequentially. The deck has been shuffled, right? All the drugs that are currently approved in second line were approved only after prior serafinib, not even lenvantinib, let alone atezobev, caboatezo, dervatremi. Uh, and how do we incorporate all these agents into our management will be uh, discussed by Dr. Goyal. And there are knowledge gaps, and at the end of the day, patients are living longer with liver cancer, they're better compensated when they progress, and we have options to treat them, though we you know, have the, 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 the data gap on how effective they are. But just like in any other tumor type, when we have advances in front line, we don't necessarily throw out everything we had learned in earlier stage. And then this idea of this heterogeneous group of intermediate patients. As we have drugs that are more effective, and again, to go back prior to 2008, <clears throat> local regional treatments had been around for a long time, and we had no good drugs to offer patients, so interventional radiology and taste filled a void. And certainly, taste beyond progression, taste for patients who had very large tumors, was done. And then we had serafinib, and again, I think the lack of an objective response rate, despite improvements in survival, uh, tempered some of the enthusiasm for that agent. And so TACE has continued to fill a void, so to speak, for patients who have large tumors, diffuse tumors, who probably are better served with local regional treatment, uh, with systemic treatments, now that we have drugs that I would argue are highly active. And Dr. Singal, uh, we'll address some of that. So, let's start with a case. This is a 64-year-old gentleman with a history of hepatitis C and cirrhosis, had a sustained virologic response, status post-treatment, who was subsequently lost to follow-up. Uh, and, and we know that patients, even though they have an SVR, remain at risk for liver cancer and need to be screened. And they present two years later with abdominal pain, so symptoms. So it goes back to their hepatologists. They're found to have cirrhosis. It's compensated. There's no evidence of ascites or encephalopathy. Here you see their lab values, which are generally pretty normal. Bilirubin 0.7, albumin 4.2, INR of 1. Platelet count is 97, so they have portal hypertension. Good performance status. 
Other labs show an alpha feta protein is elevated at 720. And uh, imaging with an ultrasound shows a large liver mass, uh, which is then confirmed with an MRI, which shows a 12 centimeter mass in the liver. It enhances on the arterial phase with delayed enhancement, uh, delayed washout. It's called LIRADS5. And you know that with liver cancer, we do not necessarily need a biopsy to make the diagnosis. If we have someone with underlying liver disease and meets these imaging characteristics, we can confidently say that this is liver cancer. Uh, and this patient also has a metastatic lesion in the adrenal gland. So what would you do next? I'm going to engage my uh, colleagues here. Lipica? You know, so certainly the standard answer here is for someone with BCLC stage C disease is to think about first-line systemic therapy. And um, I'm sure Dr. Finn will talk about the options for first-line systemic therapy. And uh, he led us with the Atezobev trial, so that would be our first choice. There are some centers, I think, where it would not be unreasonable also, because we know this patient is eventually going to use systemic therapy. It's not the standard answer. But sometimes in our tumor board, we do talk about doing local regional therapy, both to the liver mass and to the adrenal lesion, if there's no other lesions. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting uh, discussion point. Uh, because I would argue, even if they didn't have the adrenal lesion, right? This is a 12 centimeter tumor. This guy is uh, symptomatic. And you could say a 12 centimeter tumor, maybe it's BCLCB still, confined, no vascular invasion. But we know local regional treatment you know, this is not going to be a one-time taste or LR, uh, Y90. It's going to be several. And this is a systemic disease. You know, patients with liver cancer don't just succumb to a large tumor burden. They succumb to systemic uh, symptoms, weight loss, fatigue, frailty, something I appreciate so much more. And also, I would argue, this patient is on the edge of tipping over, right? This patient could very easily decompensate mm -hmm. with a little growth. So, you know, discuss at a multi -tumor, multidisciplinary tumor board, and it would be a lively discussion, especially if that adrenal lesion was not there. I know uh, there would be a lively discussion, but, you know, now that we have drugs that are active, that are inducing response, I think, and, and inducing response and survival benefit that is not trivial, uh, I think uh, most of us would go with systemic treatment. And so here you see the NCCN guidelines. Uh, Atezobev, as it is written here, uh, is still the preferred regimen. Uh, now it says child PUA only, and that is based on the fact that the Imbrave study was only done in patients who were uh, child PUA. But that could be said for serafinib and lenvantinib, right? Uh, here they have B7 for serafinib, and I think because the drug's been around so long, uh, there is... Uh, confidence that it can be done safely. What we don't know about patients with less compensated liver disease is does treating their tumor improve survival? We do not have strong data, level one evidence, taking patients who are decompensated, less than child PUA, and randomizing them to treatment or not. Uh, but I think many of us, for patients who are up and about, who can come to the clinic, will not deny them treatment, per se, as long as we think they could tolerate it. You know, NCCN also has nivolumab there. As many of you are aware, nivolumab lost uh, any FDA approval. But we could just say PD-1 inhibitor, uh, and useful in certain circumstances. As you know, level 1 evidence for the use of single-agent PD-1 in the frontline setting has been lacking, though tomorrow we'll hear about Himalaya. and. The dervalumab arm there had a non-inferiority endpoint versus serafinib, and it met that endpoint. Chemotherapy is not really used that much in the United States, and then there's a host of things to do after disease progression, which I think will come up later. So the Imbrave 150 study uh, was a global study, open label, for patients with advanced liver cancer, randomized two to one, of a tezolizumab, a pd one antibody in combination with bevacizumab, a monoclonal antibody to the VEGF protein versus serafinib. Again, patients were all child PUA in good performance status. Because of concerns about bevacizumab and bleeding risk, especially in a cirrhotic population, patients were required to have an EGD and upper endoscopy before coming on study. 
And here you see uh, the updated data from that study. Uh, the study primary endpoint was met uh, of PFS and OS. Uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and both of them had hazard ratios of about 0.58 and 0.59, respectively. However, at the time of the primary analysis, we did not have enough events to hit the true median in the treatment arm. And we see now that the true median OS with the Tezobev was 19.2 months versus 13.4 with serafinib. 19.2 months is the new benchmark for frontline survival, survival in frontline liver cancer. And PFS here did not change much with the updated data. But what's very striking is the objective response rate of 30%. So that includes 8% of patients who have complete responses, and the rest are partial responses. And we showed at ASCO, for patients who have a response, their survival, we, we still have not reached the median for that. That curve is fairly flat. For patients who even have stable disease, their survival is about 17 months. But an area of unmet need are those patients whose best response is progressive disease. And maybe we can talk about that. Because when we have a patient like this who gets a Tezobev and progresses quickly, that patient is in trouble. And, and part of the challenge for us is we don't have a biomarker to predict who these responders are. Uh, and here you see, looking at the resist criteria, objective response was 30%, 8% CRs. The duration of response, again, that was not available at the primary analysis. But for those responders, the median duration of response was 18 months. And this regimen has a very favorable toxicity profile. Here you see the most common adverse events. Uh, and in uh, dark are all grades, in, I should say in the lighter color are all grades, and the dark colors are higher grades. And you can see that for things a patient will notice, diarrhea, hand, foot, skin syndrome, anorexia, clearly occurring more frequently and with higher grade with serafinib, whereas hypertension, uh, proteinuria, infusion reactions, things that we are know are common side effects of BEV, uh, occur more commonly with a Tezobev. High-grade bleeding events were single digit in this study. And in fact, if we look at patients who had grade five events, which were very few, most of those patients had main portal vein invasion. Uh, so this idea that bevacizumab is an anticoagulant, that it's heparin, it's very dangerous, uh, has not really borne out, I think, in clinical data. And that favorable side effect profile bore itself out when we looked at quality of life. Here you look at one of the readouts, looking at time to delay in quality of life. Uh, serafinib, that occurs pretty quickly, within three and a half months. And with the Tezobev, it took over 11 months to see that decline in quality of life. So let's go back to this case, discussed at Multidisciplinary Tumor Board, Amit. Yeah, <clears throat> which, like you said, I mean, I think this patient um, warrants systemic therapy. Um, you just went over the exciting data for atezolbev, and I think this patient would be a great candidate for atezolbev. Um, of course, as you mentioned, you know, we need to do the upper endoscopy before to make sure this patient doesn't have high-risk stigmata for bleeding. You mentioned the, the low proportions of patients who had a bleeding event on the IM grade 150 trial, and I do think it's because of that careful patient selection. I mean, all patients underwent an upper endoscopy within six months. Patients with high-risk stigmata, recent bleeding, they were excluded from the clinical trial. And so that careful patient selection I think was exactly why the clinical trial results look so good, and I think have to be extrapolated when we put this when we put this doublet in clinical practice. But this patient, as you describe them, seems like a perfect candidate for a tezobev. Have you would you treat someone with a tezobev without an endoscopy? And and I say that in that, you know, you see the patient and you know with corona maybe things are delayed. Uh, and you can start treatment next week, but they won't get an endoscopy for two weeks. Yeah, um, are you asking, have I ever done that? I mean, it's, it's a little bit of, yes, I, I have done that. This is a little bit of do as I say, not as I've done. Um, you know, it's the type of thing where um, our standard practice is to, the, to do the upper endoscopy, and we do that in the vast majority of patients. However, in, in these cases where we can't get it done in a timely fashion for some reason or another, um, we have started the therapy in patients that we deem to be low risk, you know, higher platelet count, child PUA, et cetera. 
Um, and so, but we've done it on a one-off basis rather than a routine workaround for the upper endoscopy. The one other thing that I'd say is you have to be cognizant that when you do the upper endoscopy, this isn't like just doing the upper endoscopy and then ignoring the results. Some of those patients will have large varices, need to be banded, and that's not just banded and done. So you may be really in this boat where you then have this long period um, of several weeks where you can't use a TESOBEV if that patient goes down that pathway. So this patient undergoes an EGD, no varices, scheduled to see a medical oncologist, uh, and the patient gets a TESOBEV. So, you know, another discussion point along those lines uh, is how long do you think you would wait after an EGD if a patient gets banded before you started? Yeah, I don't think we know the answer to that, but you know, we typically will wait at least a couple weeks before we do this if they are banded, given the risk of banding ulcers, et cetera. Um, we know that BEV isn't a portal hypertensive bleed, um, and so we want to give it some time before those, those bands to sort of fall off and, and those ulcers to, to resolve. Uh, Lipica, what about single agent IO frontline? What's, uh, what's your thought? Yeah, one of the questions I was going to bring up to see what your practice is for both of you is sometimes when we want to start a TESO-BEV, but we want to start BEV later, the question comes up in conference, should we start a TESO alone and then add BEV in, even though there's no data for single agent a TESO, or should we do something like single agent PEMBRO or NEVO um, frontline and then at some point in the future think about a TESO-BEV, even though they've already had IO. Um, so no right answer specifically around this. I tend to, you know, there's, of course, the, the study with frontline nivolumab versus serafinib. The response rate with nivolumab was around 15%. The response rate with serafinib was 7%. Um, it was a negative trial for overall survival, but given the good tolerability and the high response rate, um, I sometimes think about using nivolumab frontline. Um, as Dr. Fran mentioned, it lost its FDA approval, so it's easier in some cases to get pembrolizumab, which has data in the second line, but not in the first line. But in someone who is not a candidate for any VEGF-directed therapy, it's not unreasonable to consider frontline pembro. Now we have combinations of dorvitremi with the results coming out soon. So if someone's a candidate for dual checkpoint inhibition and they can't get a VEGF inhibitor, then certainly think about that. So Rich, what do you, what do, you do in those cases that somebody where you can't get the upper endoscopy or needs banding, what, what is your standard practice? I'm the moderator here, am I? No. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I do not look at bevacizumab as an anticoagulant, right? Uh, the effect on portal hypertension and bleeding is a biologic effect, and, you know, I really do not have that much concern. I, I get an endoscopy, but if it's going to be somewhere between cycle one and cycle three, I'm okay with that. Certainly, again, taking into account their platelet count, right? I, they, ideally, they do get it beforehand, mm. but sometimes, just for whatever reason, it can't. Uh, and again, if their risk is minimal clinically, then I think I'm okay starting. Uh, okay, so our next speaker, uh, Mitesh Borad will be talking about some of the updated data that's coming out. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Finn, for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone uh, here at ASCO GI at the Peer Review Symposium. As was highlighted, this patient has advanced metastatic disease and would be appropriate for systemic therapies. Of course, clinical trials should also be a consideration in such patients. We'll start with looking at dual checkpoint inhibition strategies, and some of the more advanced efforts in this arena are the Himalaya study, looking at durvalumab and tremolumumab, and the Checkmate 90W study, looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab. So the concept bears on two aspects. One is uh, the priming phase, which looks at the B7 CTLA-4 checkpoint, uh, which would be targeted with drugs such as ipilimumab and tremolimumab, and the effector phase, which would be the <coughs> classical PD-1, PD-L1 uh, checkpoint, which is targeted with the drugs shown there, predominant amongst them nivolumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, durvalumab, and others. 
So start with tremolumumab and durvalumab. This is a study uh, that was a multi-arm phase two study, 330 patients, looked at four different strategies, single agent tremolumumab, single agent durvalumab, and then two strategies with the doublet, uh, one with tremolumumab and durvalumab where there was <clears throat> more consistent dosing, which is labeled as a T75 plus D, and one with the priming strategy where a single dose of tremolumumab uh, at 300 milligrams is given, followed by durvalumab given monthly. Uh, that was the uh, <clears throat> dose that we'll uh, focus on uh, as we go along uh, in terms of phase three outcomes. So in this phase two study, uh, one can see that with the doublets, you have higher rates of grade three and four treatment-related adverse events. Uh, these are predominantly immune-mediated uh, toxicities. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that the rate of grade five toxicities, which would be death, is no different with the doublets. The overall response rate um, <clears throat> with the priming strategy with 300 of tremolumumab was 24%, and with the more continuous dosing was 9.5%, so somewhat similar to the single agent uh, strategies. The duration of response was not re reached with the priming strategy, and you can see it ranges from about a year to two years um, with the other arms. Uh, shown here, uh, again, are those same data in terms of overall survival uh, outcomes. One can see that the median overall survival was the highest with the priming strategy. Of course, the caveat is that these are um, not randomized patients, and uh, while the numerical uh, superiority uh, is certainly seen in the uh, priming arm, uh, certainly the other arms could have potentially performed as well. With that being said, the decision was made to take forward the priming arm into later stage studies. Uh, this was the basis of the Himalaya study. Uh, this is a phase three study comparing serafinib being the control with duralumab uh, in a non-inferior fashion and then two doublets, duralumab and tremolumumab, either in a four-dose strategy or in a priming dose strategy uh, for the tremolumumab, as I highlighted earlier. Uh, patients were advanced with BCLC stage B or C, child PUA, uh, untreated before in terms of systemic therapy, and over 1,000 patients study as highlighted here. Primary endpoint was overall survival. Other endpoints were safety and other efficacy endpoints as shown here. Um, should be noted that this study uh, will be presented uh, at this meeting and uh, the abstract has been released um, with high level data being released uh, prior to the the, the meeting uh, initiating. Again, I remind you to um, tune into the presentation at this meeting for the Himalaya study. This is uh, clearly a landmark study in this field with a dual checkpoint strategy showing overall survival benefit. The other doublet is nivolumab and ipilimumab, which is already FDA approved based on a phase two study, the Checkmate 040 study. Um, and here, uh, this combination was studied using several different uh, permutations as shown here. Um, arm A, looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab in an every three week fashion. Arm C doing the same, but with different flipping the dosing of uh, nivolumab and nipilumumab, and arm C looking at nivolumab every two weeks and nipilumumab every uh, six weeks. We can see that the overall response rates were in the 30% range for uh, all of the arms. Uh, the <clears throat> overall survival was highest in arm A 
at about 23 months. Uh, again, these are phase two data, so we don't know in the phase three setting uh, what would be the outcomes when choosing the different permutations. But uh, given the, the differences, the ARM A uh, combination was the one that would be moved forward. The toxicities would be the ones we would expect from using these doublets, which would be autoimmune toxicities, predominantly higher rates of hepatitis. Of course, you would see other things such as rash, adrenal insufficiency, diarrhea, and pneumonitis, as highlighted here. Uh, the grade three and four toxicity rate uh, would be higher than if one were to use single agents as well, and this is not a, unexpected. And as I highlighted uh, <clears throat> previously, this is the basis of the phase three Checkmate 90W trial, which looks at this immune checkpoint doublet versus serafinib or lenvatinib. Again, an over 1,000 patient study good performance status patients, preserved liver function with child pu 5 or 6, um, and previously untreated. Primary endpoint is overall survival, secondary endpoints are other efficacy endpoints, and uh, quality of life and safety measures. In addition to the immune checkpoint dual inhibition, we also have com other combinations looking at immunotherapy combined with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So these are the COSMIC 312 and LEAP002 studies, which are most advanced uh, in their status. We'll start with the COSMIC 312 study. This looked at cabozantinib uh, with or without atezolizumab versus serafinib, and you can see that there are three arms, serafinib being the control arm, being compared to cabozantinib or the doublet of cabozantinib and atezolizumab. Uh, 640 patient study, uh, advanced and metastatic patients who would have BCLC stage B or C, child PUA, and good ECOG performance scores. Primary endpoints here were dual, progression-free survival and overall survival, clearly overall survival being the meaningful one at the end of the day. So the progression-free survival for the cabozantinib etazolizumab doublet was superior compared to serafinib, 6.8 versus 4.2 months, hazard ratio 0.63, p-value 0.0012, so clearly very statistically significant. Unfortunately, the overall survival was no different, serafinib 15.5 months, and the doublet of cabozantinib etazolizumab 15.4 months. Uh, the, Reasoning for this could be multifold, including uh, treatment at the time of crossover. The response rates are numerically higher in the uh, doublet arm, cabozantinib and atezolizumab, 11% versus 3.7%. We do see some complete responses, which are not noted in either of the single agent TKI arms. The time to response and the duration of responses look fairly similar across three arms. The toxicities uh, with regards to the doublet versus the singlets would primarily be different in the paradigm of the immune-related events, and this is not unexpected. We see ALT and AST increase, which is immune-related hepatitis. Uh, we do see the other toxicities such as diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, fatigue, and hypertension um, <clears throat> being similar across all the arms uh, given that they have uh, a component of TKI in all of them, whether it's singlet or doublet. The basis for the pembrolizumab and lenvatinib study is shown here. This is the phase 1b keynote 524 trial. Uh, looking at lenvatinib in combination with pembrolizumab, the response rate is in the mid 30% range as shown here on a resist basis. The duration of response is over a year. The time to response is fairly quick, less than three months. Um, and this formed the basis for the phase three study uh, that is ongoing at this time. 
Uh, this is shown here. This is the LEAP002 study, first line study of lenvatinib with pembrolizumab compared to lenvatinib alone. Uh, this is again in the same types of patients I alluded to earlier, BCLC, B or C, child PUA, ECOG performance score zero or one. Primary endpoints are again are dual, overall survival and progression-free survival. Secondary endpoints are safety and other efficacy endpoints. Here are a number of other studies looking at the combination of immune checkpoint inhibitors with antiangiogenics, primarily tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, looking at the range of regorafenib, serafenib, gabazantinib, uh, and lenvatinib with all of the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors I described earlier uh, with respect to PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies. As you can see, there is a tremendous amount of activity in the advanced hepatocellular cancer space. Um, I want to again thank the organizers for the kind invitation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maitesh, uh, for that exciting overview. I mean, there is so much going on in the liver cancer space now, and I think our expectations have changed. You know, it's not just improving survival with stable disease, but, you know, focusing on high objective response rates that are very durable. And it's incredibly gratifying to be sitting with a patient now and see rapidly their AFP start dropping, seeing their, their tumor shrink, and seeing these patients alive for years, literally. I have I've several patients now who had very advanced tumors that are just doing incredibly well. So here, this case changes a little bit. And you know, it's the same patient with the same tumor burden still well compensated, but had a recent GI bleed. Uh, and, you know, one of the questions, and maybe I'll uh, throw it back to you, uh, Amit, and just to clarify, you know, Amit is a uh, hepatologist who has done a lot of work in liver cancer. Uh, Amit, you know, with this patient now, GI bleeding, you scope them, you know, varices that are managed, you know, maybe no, no evidence of recent bleed or bleeding varices, get started on beta blockers, you know, let's go six months in the future. How are you going to approach this patient? Yeah, you know, so Rich, um, this patient technically with a history of, you know, variceal bleeding was excluded from the I Am Brave 150 trial, so there is less safety data in this patient population, but I think that you are right. The further we get out from that GI bleed, um, presumably that treating with BEV would be safer, and so you could consider a TESO-BEV as you get further and further out from that um, you know, history of variceal bleeding, particularly if the upper endoscopy is reassuring. I think now that we've seen other agents that have been introduced that have shown um, efficacy and um, superiority to, you know, serafinib in the frontline setting, you know, specifically Dervatrava being presented tomorrow, I think it gives us other options. And so this would be someone that I would look at the other options as well. Um, and so, you know, obviously serafinib, lenvatinib, and now with Dervatrava after the approval, I think this is a perfect patient that I would consider an alternative agent rather than considering a Tizobev. If there is something that makes you think that you can't use those other agents, for whatever reason, I think you'd probably, the further you get out, then you can maybe be, you know, treat with the TESO-BEV, to your point about BEV not being, you know, an anticoagulant, et cetera. You could, you could consider this. So I, I think when I see a patient, Lipica, I'm thinking, why can't I give this patient a TESO-BEV, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if they can't get a TESO because they have some autoimmune problem, they're not going to be an option for another doublet right? And it's the BEV that I think that comes up as the bigger issue. And so conceivably, we'll have a Tezo Cabo, Derva Tremi. What are your thoughts? It's, it's, I like that your default mode is a Tezo BEV, and how can I do, what, what goes away from a Tezo BEV? Well, I, I say that, you know, and I, you know, obviously I, I was involved with the trial. I was very blessed to do that, but Activity, you know, 30% response rate, survival 19 months, right? 
Or, and if you feel differently, please comment. <laughs> no, I think we all think of Atezopeb as the default now. Um, you know, I think we all need biomarkers, which we've all talked about, uh, ideally non-invasive biomarkers, like blood-based biomarkers. And I think most of us, if we're starting someone on systemic therapy, we will biopsy the tumor, even though, as Rich mentioned, uh, in HCC, because it has specific radiological characteristics, we don't always need a biopsy. But the way we're going to advance the field is to do biopsies and do these biomarkers. In the absence of that, I certainly look at clinical biomarkers, like all the ones that we've been talking about, in terms of do they have any contraindications to VEGF inhibition. So, you know, if they can't get IO, right, then we're pretty much left with the drugs we've had, which, you know, have held the line for some time. You know, serafinib was very hard to beat. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, lenvantinib did not beat it when we look at the primary endpoint of overall survival is non-inferior, though I think the sense is that it is maybe a more active drug, and the OS might have been contaminated by other post-progression treatments. But if we look at responses, actually, Linvantinib's objective response rate in Reflect was about uh, 18, 19 percent. And a nice study done by Dr. Kudo presented here, I think the last time we were in person, showed that for patients who have a response in the REFLEX study, survival was about 24 months. And actually, 24 months, I think, is a number that's coming up as we look at IO regimens for patients who have a response as well. Uh, and there is a lot of data, uh, uh, and, and obviously that would be an option for, not the, for the non-bleeding population. Dervabev, a regimen that's being looked at in early stage chemoembolization studies and adjuvant studies. Uh, and here you see this data from objective response rate of 21%, uh, a small number of patients, 27, but I think this just supports a lot of the objective responses we've seen with IO. Uh, Atezocabo, you know, met its primary endpoint of PFS. I think one of the issues with OS, it's immature, but still uh, we'll have to wait for longer follow-up, and, and that will also be at risk from treatment beyond progression. And obviously, child PUB patients, right? That patient who can come to the office, you know, what do we do for them in the lack of prospective data? Uh, there is two abstracts here, small data sets of a Tezobev in less compensated patients uh, from two different institutions. That shows that, you know, it is tolerable in selected patients who are non-child PUA. And you know, these patients who are advanced, we can identify patients who can do extremely well. So the Barcelona B patient. So this is that population that's intermediate, who progressed on TACE or were not candidates for TACE, who were on the Embrave 150 study. Their median survival was 26 months, right? So a subset of patients. Uh, and similarly, for those patients who were considered Barcelona C, probably before, because of their performance status, uh, median survival of about 25 months if they don't have extra hepatic spread or MVI. And again, I think this makes the case of moving systemic treatment earlier in a patient's course. So with that, patients will eventually progress. What do we do next, Lipica? Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here today. So as Rich mentioned, we have a Tezobev in the first line, but we don't have data for what to do next. It's a data-free zone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about sequencing for HCC. So let's go to another case. The 67-year-old woman with non-alcoholic hepatitis, who was found to have an, a 9-centimeter HCC with right portal vein invasion, and she was started on a Tezobev. While on atezobev, she had an episode of grade two immune-related colitis, so had a fair amount of diarrhea, and she was treated with steroids, which is how we treat a lot of these immune-related AEs, and the colitis resolved. She was re-challenged with atezobev and had a partial response of around 40%. And then at 12 months from start, she had disease progression with new metastatic disease in her lungs, and she remained, luckily, a child, child PUA liver function, good performance status, and our AFP was 198. So I'm at the patient like this. How would you think about what to do next? 
So this is someone who basically was started on Tizobev, had progression, and so at this point, I think we have multiple options. I think that you could consider TKI therapies. I think many of us would go to TKI therapy. And then there's also the combinations, for example, Ipinevo, where you can add in CTLA-4. But I think the key thing is you want to choose an option where you add in a unique mechanism in the second mm -hmm. line. As Rich already mentioned, we don't have data after atezolizumab. We extrapolate data after serafinib. But we don't want to forget the data that we learned after serafinib progression. Yeah, so as we think about what options we have next, you know, we have to use the data that we have. And so the options are to go with drugs that are approved in the second line after serafinib, or to go with drugs that are approved in the first line but haven't been used yet. So I think many of us will think about using these first line options because they have a fair amount of activity, lenvatinib and serafinib. So I'm gonna talk about these options first. Rich already went over much of the data, so I'll keep it brief. And then I'll talk about the other drugs that are approved in the second line, uh, regorafenib and um, ramacirumab, and then cabozantinib, which is approved in second or third line. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the immunotherapy agents that we haven't yet talked about for the data. So first line, uh, TKIs, as Rich mentioned, there's serafinib and lenvatinib, and there are three trials that inform this, the SHARP trial, the Asia-Pacific trial, and the REFLECT trial. The response rates were a little bit lower with serafinib and a little bit higher with lenvatinib, but overall lenvatinib was found to be non-inferior to serafinib. And as Rich said, you know, in some countries, what people can get access to after lenvatinib was different than what they could get access to after serafinib. So um, in certain countries, like, such as European countries, um, patients were able to get more treatments in the serafinib arm than they were in the lenvatinib arm, and that might have impacted the fact that there was quite a difference in the PFS between lenvatinib and serafinib, but then in the OS, there was only about a one-month difference. Um, and so we certainly think about these two drugs next, and one thing to think about is their safety profile. Now, lenvatinib has much more potent activity against VEGFR2, and that likely impacts its, both its efficacy and its safety. So you see more VEGF-related AEs with lenvatinib, where you see higher rates of hypertension, um, higher rates of uh, proteinuria, actually, as well. And as Rich mentioned with uh, bevacizumab, these are some of the more asymptomatic um, AEs. With uh, serafinib, you see lower rates of hypertension and proteinuria. You see, see a higher rate of the hand-foot syndrome. So one of the things I think about when choosing between these two agents are uh, how badly does someone need a response in terms of are they having symptoms from their disease and is there sort of what we call sometimes in clinic impending doom from the tumor? Um, and then also what are their comorbidities? Do they have uncontrolled hypertension? Do they have diabetes already with, with protein urea that's tough to control? And then think about these two and of course do decision making, uh, shared decision making with our patients. So next, I'll talk about um, Rego, Cabo, and then uh, Ramacirumab. So regorafenib is very similar to serafinib. It's basically the chemical structure of the drug is the same as serafinib, except there's a fluorine molecule on the central phenyl ring. And so one of the eligibility criteria for this trial was that patients needed to have tolerance of serafinib at least 400 milligrams per day for 20 of the previous 28 days. You know, one thing to pay attention to in these three trials, the REGO trial, the CABO trial, and the RAM trial, is they each have one unique eligibility criteria that helps us think sort of as a clinical biomarker how to choose between these three drugs. And so for REGO, people had to have tolerance of serafinib. And this was an over 500 patient trial. Patients were randomized in a two to one fashion to REGO versus placebo. And as you can see, there's a separation of the curves. The primary endpoint was overall survival. And in the regorafenib arm, the overall, median overall survival was 10.6 months versus 7.2 months in the placebo arm, and this gained FDA approval. Now, nowadays, we also really pay attention to real-world data. Of course, there's the clinical trial population, which is a highly select population, but then when you use these drugs in the real world, how do they fare? So first, in terms of side effects, the main side effects with regorafenib are the hand-foot syndrome that we talked about you see with serafinib, and then some GI side effects like diarrhea, and then also some fatigue and decreased appetite. 
Um, remarkably, when you look at the right side of the, of the slide, you can see that the median PFS was very similar in the resource trial, which was the clinical trial in the refined study, which is a real world study. And same thing with the median OS, very similar in these two. So this is reassuring that also when regorafenib is used in the real world, you see similar efficacy outcomes. And then for the celestial trial, you know, one of the unique characteristics of this trial was that you could have had at least one or two prior lines of therapy, and you didn't have to have tolerance of uh, serafinib. Now, cabozantinib is also a multi-kinase inhibitor, and one of the unique aspects of cabozantinib compared to all the other TKIs in HCC is that it's a MET inhibitor. And there are data that one of the mechanisms of VEGF resistance is through MET. And so some people actually prefer cabozantinib as the next line agent after atezobev, specifically because of that preclinical data. But we need more data to figure out if that's uh, the right next choice. Um, so in this trial, the phase three celestial trial, over 700 patients, patients were randomized in a two to one fashion to cabo versus placebo. And as you can see, the median survival in the cabo arm was 10.2 months, 8.0 in placebo, and this gained FDA approval. And then finally, the ramacirumab study. This is a monoclonal antibody against VEGFR2, a little different than bevacizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the ligand VEGF. This is against the receptor. And uh, this is one unique thing about ramacirumab is it's one of the, this study was one of the few studies that emerged out of a subgroup analysis. So there was the REACH study, which was ramacirumab versus placebo in an unselected population. And in that study, in the subgroup analysis, it was patients that had an AFP of equal to or greater than 400 that ended up seeing, seeming like they had the most benefit. And so then there was another randomized phase three trial, the REACH2 study, which is this presented here, where patients specifically with an AFP of greater than or equal to 400 were um, randomized to, in a two to one fashion to ramacirumab or placebo. And this was a positive study with the median survival being longer in the ramacirumab arm. And so what is the exact mechanism of why the patients with AFP that's high benefit more? You know, potentially these patients have more vascular invasion and um, they benefit from a VEGF inhibitor, VEGFR2 inhibitor. So back to the case, the patient got a tezobev, they had the colitis, they had the partial response, and now they're progressing. Um, what option would we use? And so these are the options here. And so, Rich, what would you use in this patient? Yeah. So, you know, and this also relates to some of the questions. And, and I think, you know, we've become a little spoiled in the past year and a half where we have, you know, a very active ac option front line. And when patients progress, and there's different types of progression, there's the patient who progresses at three months and the patient that progresses after a year. And I think their biology is different uh, because I know if this patient is progressing on a Tezobev, you know, TKIs will probably improve their survival, but we're not going to do better than a 40% shrinkage with a disease control on any given agent for a year. I mean, certainly there are those patients, but it's not the expectation. I think a real question for us is, you know, will there be a role for ipinevo? You know, a, a different mechanism than VEGF? Will there be a role for a VEGF receptor? CABO, IO, LEN, PEMBRO. Uh, and again, we don't have that data. Uh, technically, uh, they're not approved as combinations in this setting. But part of me says, you know, I want to give this patient something exciting. With that being said, you know, this patient, I would probably go with a LEN-based regimen. Uh, uh, you know, either single-agent LEN or trade out, you know, uh, the BEV for LEN. And there are clinical studies. There's a large phase three study now in Europe looking at, I think it's a Tezo-LEN after a Tezo-BEV or single-agent LEN. Optimal. Yeah, and Rich, you bring up a great point, which is for many of us, our first choice is going on to a clinical trial whenever there's a data-free zone. So with a Tezobev, we don't have anything second line, and um, many uh, different companies have opened up trials where in the second line, what should we be doing when people have immunotherapy resistance or VEGF resistance? And so if there is a clinical trial open, that's often what we'll go to because ultimately we want more drugs approved for patients so there's more access. 
So this patient did go on to lenvatinib, and the patient had stable disease on lenvatinib, developed grade three hypertension. The drug was held. The dose of lenvatinib was reduced from 12 milligrams to eight milligrams. The patient tolerated this okay, but then three months later, the patient had an AFP of 265. And so as, um, as Rich mentioned, the other TKIs in the second line and also ramucirumab, they all had single digit uh, response rates. Um, and so, like this patient. Uh, this patient had stable disease. Of course, Lenvatinib was a first-line agent usually, but it's something to be aware of. So after Lenvatinib, Amit, what would you do in this patient? Yeah, so I think then you're really getting into the third-line agents. Um, mm -hmm. When you get, start to get into third-line agents, really the only thing that's been studied in the third line is cabozantinib. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is something that I would consider cabozantinib at this point um, personally. I think the only things you can say that you know may be quote unquote incorrect is you know this patient has an AFP that's still less than 400, so ramucirumab hasn't sort of met its eligibility. And you talked about ragorafenib, you know, really requiring serafenib sort of tolerance at least for clinical trial eligibility. You can argue tolerance of LEN may apply, but you can you can argue that cabozantinib is probably the most studied in the third line and, and reach for that. And also has that different mechanism of action with having some meta inhibition as well. And so as uh, Rich brought up, what about immunotherapy? What about thinking about a CTLA-4 antibody along with a um, PD-L1 or PD-1 antibody? And so before we talk about the dual agent, just the data for nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Um, nivolumab, you know, before we learned to run in HCC, uh, we learned to walk with these single <laughs> agents. And, um, you know, it's always good to talk to colleagues who treat other cancers because I think of atezobev as you know, really setting off an earthquake in the field of HCC, because 19 months was almost a doubling of what we got with serafinib originally. But you know, when I talk to my colleagues who take care of patients with breast cancer or prostate cancer, they're like, Lippy, how are you getting excited about 19 months? That's really poor. But you know, we make steady progress over many years of dedicated efforts. And so with nivolumab, the response rate was about 14 to 20% and the duration of response was uh, nine point, over 9.9 .9 months. And then with pembrolizumab in the second line after serafinib, uh, the response rate was around 17%, and this is FDA approved in that setting. And then of course, Dr. Borat went over the data for nivolumab and ipilimumab with a response rate of 32%. I'll briefly just, briefly just share the long-term results of these um, studies. With pembrolizumab, you can see that the overall, the median overall survival was nearly 14 months, and with placebo, it was 10.6 months, with a higher rate of complete responses in the pembro arm. And then, uh, as Dr. Borad mentioned, the results of nevo ipi the arm that went forward for the 90W study, had a median survival of 22.2 months. And again, one of the most important things is that sometimes we're hitting home runs with immunotherapy, whereas usually with TKIs, we're hitting bunts. Of course, there are people that end up having responses that many of them do very well. But one of the most remarkable things that we're seeing with immunotherapy is that, as Rich was saying, there's some people who, for years, do very well. So when do we think about using immunotherapy beyond the first line? So certainly if someone got serafinib or lenvatinib first line, immunotherapy, you know, my cancer center chief always says, you should never let a patient uh, go down without a dose of immunotherapy in any GI cancer. And so certainly if someone got serafinib or um, uh, lenvatinib first line, I think about immunotherapy second. Um, if they had rapid progression or intolerance to the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the, the side effect profile for some of the TKIs, some patients have a really tough time with them. So um, if they have a tough time or if they progress quickly, we think about the immunotherapy. And then in the setting of uh, poor hepatic function, so as was mentioned earlier, there are some data from the Checkmate 040 study, one arm that had patients with child pew B7 or P8, B8 disease that got nivolumab. So certainly when patients who have slightly worse function, I think about using nivolumab in these patients as uh, per the NCCN guidelines. And then as we've already talked many times, if people have contraindications to anti-angiogenic therapy. So, you know, before we go on to the last talk, I mean, my Tesh, you, you presented a lot of combinations, mostly studied in the front line, right? So in your opinion, 
as these get approved, you'll pick one front line. Do you see a role for using these second line? Thanks for the question, Rich. I, I, I think um, <clears throat> as you highlighted with some patient uh, characteristic differences in the uh, Himalaya study and in the Embrave study, you could use that as a selection criterion. I did find it interesting in the Himalaya study that the three-year survival with the doublet was quite impressive in the 30% range. Uh, if you look at the ipi nevo data, actually, um, it goes all the way out to 54 months, uh, and about 30% of patients were alive there as well. So I think immunotherapy will probably start uh, getting used more and more, and the questions are going to evolve to being, do you use a triplet now, uh, or you go head-to-head -to, -head to Tezobev versus Durvatremi and see, uh, you know, in those patients where you maybe don't have varices, which is the better uh, way to go? Uh, is it the survival differences out one, two, three years that are more important, or is it really the median survivals and responses? Yeah, it's interesting, because you, you alluded to this, Lipica. You know, the melanoma people have been dealing with this for many years, right? IO became the standard of care front line, and I don't think they've answered the question of what you do when you progress on frontline I.O., right? And, and, you know, people have looked at LAG3 and CTLA4 and other, other markers, and I don't know that they've answered the question either, and I'm not sure we're going to answer it before them in liver cancer. Uh, you know, you bring up an interesting concept, uh, Mitesh, you know, how do we move ahead on frontline, right? I, I don't see us doing a head-to-head -head study that I don't think would move the needle so much, but what will be that third agent added to a Tezobev or Derva, Tremi, a Tezocabo that will move it, move the field further. And, and you know, there's a very interesting design from uh, Roche, the Morpheus study, which is using an Tezobev backbone, and then doing signal finding, you know, cohorts where they drop in a third agent. Uh, you know, we're talking about sequencing drugs. Right, so, you know, if we go back to serafinib, it was serafinib beyond progression, because we didn't have much to offer, right? So, uh, Amit, you know, when do you stop your front line to go to second line, right? What is your criteria now? Yeah, I think now that we have multiple um, efficacious agents that can induce responses and improve survival, um, you know, I think you, you stop at time of progression, um, and you look for something different at that time. You know, Rich, you already described the differences between survival, between responders, stable disease, and progressors. So we know that um, people who progress do worse. And it doesn't make sense. It, I mean, the days of treating beyond progression, at least in my mind, should be over, because those were days when we didn't have something efficacious to switch to. And so now that we have these other agents, I think when you progress, you should be looking for that other drug. Just because we don't know the best drug, I think there's that's because there's multiple likely options rather than a lack of options. So there's a question here, Lipica. You're at a large center, a Mass General, very good surgeons. When you see a, a, a large tumor, no extrahepatic disease, no venous invasion, are your surgeons saying, you know, give them systemic treatment and downstage them so I can resect them? Or are they still saying, you know, taste them and then embolize the left low, you know, has systemic treatment impacted earlier stage disease? It's a great question. I would say if the tumor is resectable up front, our surgeons will often just resect, even if it's, you know, a 15 centimeter tumor, because, uh, you know, as we saw in the Atezo-Bev study, there was a 19% rate of primary progression at the first scan. And so if something is resectable and they progress and they become unresectable, you know, you could say that, well, maybe they um, were going to do poorly anyway. Maybe you save them from that. But I think the neoadjuvant strategy is coming in HCC, but is not standard of care yet. You know, of course, there's the study of using radiation in the setting of patients with HCC and portal vein thrombosis, and then getting people to surgery as opposed to surgery up front for portal vein thrombosis um, with patients for HCC with portal vein thrombosis. I think now there are now we have a study ongoing at MGH with 
atezobev, frontline, um, and then going to surgery actually in patients who have resectable disease. Um, but I think, and also we have um, a study of atezobev, uh, then radiation um, for patients with portal vein thrombosis. And so I think, as you were alluding to when you were talking about the BCLC staging system, we're now migrating some of the systemic therapies to the left and we're migrating some of the liver-directed therapies to the right, where now they're combo studies of TACE and immunotherapy, or Y90 and immunotherapy, or radiation and immunotherapy for BCLC stage C as well. So, you know, there's several questions here that I think relate to the next talk uh, about transitioning from local regional treatment to systemic treatment, adjuvant use of systemic treatment. So, uh, Amit, if you could please take that away. Yes, yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Rich. Um, and I think that last question you asked really is, is a perfect transition into this, in this next talk. So um, in contrast to the last three talks that you've heard that really focus on you know, completed phase three trials or phase three trials that are near completion, I think this last talk really um, is looking many years ahead in terms of earlier trials and um, what should be coming or what may be coming um, years down the road. Um, so I'm really going to be talking about different stages of disease and what are the emerging multimodal approaches uh, for, for those different stages. We'll, we'll start with the systemic therapy um, space, and, and really this, um, the first uh, study that we'll talk about is um, taking a look at TT fields, um, which is a very different type of therapy than, than the agents that we've discussed before. So TT fields um, are alternating electronic fields that take advantage of the fact that cancer cells clearly are dividing faster um, than other cells in the body. And it uses these alternating electrical fields that can um, disrupt charged particles during mitoses and thereby induce cell death. Um, and so you can see there that, you know, once again, one would anticipate this to be more active in cancers than background liver in this case or other non-cancerous liver cells. So um, to start the talk, we're actually going to watch a video about the mechanism of action of TT fields. In metaphase of cell division, cells are a rounded shape as the mitotic spindle forms. Intracellular components such as macromolecules and organelles are naturally charged. Tumor-treating fields, or TT fields, disrupt cancer cell division by physically interacting with molecules required for mitosis. When alternating electric fields are applied to cancer cells, they disrupt microtubule polymerization. Tubulin dimers align with the electric field and are not able to form microtubules. This prevents the organized assembly of the mitotic spindle required for normal cell division. The inhibition of microtubule formation leads to metaphase arrest and cancer cell death. In addition, these deformed microtubules can lead to abnormal DNA segregation between daughter cells, which also results in cancer cell death. TT fields can also affect cells after metaphase. If a cancer cell has passed metaphase and enters the cytokinesis phase, the cell takes on an hourglass shape. This state under TT fields creates a non-uniform electric field inside the cell creating dielectrophoresis. Net forces push the macromolecules and organelles toward the mitotic furrow, and this disruption leads to structural disorganization and cancer cell death. Transducer arrays can be placed on the scalp, chest, or torso to deliver TT fields that kill cancer cells. The placement of transducer arrays is personalized for each patient. So I think, you know, these TT fields are kind of like a sci-fi approach um, to, to cancer and, and HCC specifically in, in our case, but clearly is different than the TKI approach or the immune checkpoint inhibitors that we're talking about, and I think offer a different type of mechanism that we may see move forward in the future. Um, so the other interesting thing are TT fields are frequency tuned to the specific cancer type. So you can see here, um, you know, the, the different cancers outlined here and the different frequencies and you can also see that this differs from normal background cells. And this is really how these tumor treating fields can be quite specific and thereby once again induce cell death, for example, in the HEC cells, but spare other cells that may be um, happening in the background, most notably in this case, liver cells. 
This has been evaluated in the phase two HEPA-NOVA trial in advanced stage HEC. This was tumor treating fields concurrent with serafinib. Um, this was a small study involving 25 patients, uh, once again receiving the combinations and um, then being followed until progressive disease with the primary endpoint being overall radiologic response. And um, basically the, the phase two study, um, once again 27 patients, um, about half of them being uh, child pu B, half being child pu A. Um, you can see their very exciting sort of disease control and objective response rates for, in this very small study. Um, and this is now moving forward in terms of larger phase three studies that now are combining the tumor treating fields in combination uh, with atezolizumab, atezolizumab and bevacizumab. And this was granted to FDA breakthrough therapy designation and so we do anticipate this continuing to move forward. And there are poster presentations in terms of um, uh, data even here at, at ASCO GI. So in terms of the, the remaining 15 minutes of the talk, I want to move now away from the advanced stage setting, which we've been focused on for most of the, the evening, and really now start talking about earlier phases of disease or earlier stages of disease. So I'm now going to move into intermediate stage disease and talk about treatment options um, and, and that are emerging here. So the case that we have is a 45-year-old woman, a uh, history of NASH-related cirrhosis compensated uh, in nature, so no ascites, no encephalopathy, um, and has imaging that shows an incidental liver mass. Uh, the MRI in this case shows an 8-centimeter um, LR5 lesion, so Rich already talked about this being definite for HCC, no need for a biopsy. Um, and this patient has two satellite nodules around this larger liver mass. Um, this patient has no vascular invasion, no metastatic spread, and as I mentioned, is child QA, so good liver function, good performance status with the ECOG performance status of zero. So, you know, for this patient who has intermediate stage disease, really the standard of care for, for many years um, has been local regional therapy. So this has been the area where taste and tear have been really the mainstays of therapy and, and um, have been used in centers for the entire um, BCLC stage B uh, um, group. Now, Rich has already mentioned that there are data that, that you know, that local regional therapies tend to be overused um, in clinical practice, not only for patients with advanced stage disease, but one can also argue that they may be overused for some patients um, with intermediate stage disease. Um, and I say this because we are now um, increasingly cognizant that BCLC stage B, this intermediate stage, is very heterogeneous in nature. So one patient with BCLC stage B is not equal to another. And there have now been prognostic scores that help us differentiate these different patients who have BCLC stage B. One of those prognostic scores is the 6 and 12 score, so this simply adds the number of lesions and the largest diameter, and when you do that, you get this summed number. And if you're less than 6, you have the best outcome with a median survival in this study of around 49 months. If your number is in the middle of 6 and 12, you have a median survival of 32 months. And if that sum is the, um, exceeds 12, you see that those patients have very poor survival um, of 16 months. And so we, we understand that these patients are inherently different, but have historically been dumped into one BCLC bucket. And the other reason why this is important is not only the natural history of these patients differs, but their response to local regional therapy dramatically differs. So those patients who have smaller number of tumors, smaller tumor size, respond very well to local regional therapy. And not only do you see high responses in, the, in those patients, but you're able to get away with treating them with fewer therapies. Those patients who have multi, multifocal disease, bilobar disease, large tumors, have lower responses and often require multiple therapies to achieve that same level of response. Now, this is important because we've already talked about that HCC typically occurs in the background of cirrhosis. So every time you do one of those local regional therapies, it's not just about inducing response in that HCC, but it's also thinking about the collateral damage to the background liver. So it's almost like taking a hammer every time you do a chemoembolization and whacking it against the, against the liver. At some point, you're going to have some degree of liver dysfunction that happens from those repeated therapies. And so there's increasing recognition that those patients who have large multifocal bilobar disease or large tumors 
have poor responses to taste and may be better suited for other therapies. And so now what we've started to think about is that we should treat these patients differently. So Rich started the, pre the presentation today about talking about downstaging. So these patients who are technically in the BCLC stage B group, but are on what I call the B plus group, so close to an A but not quite there, those patients who are within UNOS you know, downstaging criteria, um, so limited disease but in the BCLC stage B category, who you treat with local regional therapy have a very good chance of having a response. And if those patients respond and then fall within Milan criteria, these patients can be successfully transplanted and achieve very good outcomes. And actually the outcomes for patients who start in the BCLC stage B category, downstaged into early stage and are transplanted have similar outcomes to those patients who are found initially at an early stage. And so this is often regarded as the standard pathway for these patients with limited BCLC stage B disease. Local regional therapy with the destination of downstaging to early stage disease and considering liver transplantation. In contrast to those patients who I personally call BCLC B minus, so you know, more advanced BCLC stage B disease, once again, perhaps these patients should instead be treated with systemic therapy. So maybe local regional therapy is not the right treatment for these patients given a low chance of response and a high chance of liver dysfunction. Now this concept was actually evaluated in a proof of concept study by Kudor and colleagues where they took a propensity score matched cohort where they took patients treated with lenvatinib and compared them to patients treated with TACE who had intermediate stage disease. And what they found in this study is that those patients who were treated with lenvatinib for, for intermediate stage disease actually had better survival than those patients who were treated with chemoembolization up front. Now, when they looked at this, that improvement in survival appeared to be driven by lower rates of liver dysfunction over time. So when you take a look at the ALBI score, so you know, a score of liver function based on albumin and bilirubin, the liver function was more preserved in the lenvatinib group than it was in that group that underwent upfront chemoembolization. Once again, small propensity score retrospective analysis, so not you know, proving this, but at least a nice proof of concept that now has informed ongoing phase three studies. So there's the ABC-HCC trial, which is now comparing atizolizumab and bevacizumab versus TACE for patients with intermediate stage disease, as well as the RENO-TACE study comparing the combination of regorafenib and nivolumab versus TACE for intermediate stage HCC. These are only two of the studies that are ongoing. They're early in development, but I think that these are gonna be very interesting and perhaps you know, practice changing trials of how we should be treating these patients with larger intrahepatic disease. Now, beyond you know, one or the other, so why can't we have our cake and eat it too? So there has been now this thought of like, let's just combine things, and so can we combine systemic therapy and local regional therapy? Now, like everything in HCC, this really started with the TKIs, right? So the, the question was, after approval of serafinib in the front line for systemic therapy, there was, um, you know, at least rationale for moving TKIs in earlier stages of disease and combining this with local regional therapy. Basically, um, you know, we can, we can basically increase um, anti-apoptotic proteins, we can um, induce hypoxia, we can, de um, you know, basically affect... An um, uh, angiogenesis, so we can basically combine the benefits of TKI therapy and, and, and combine this with chemoembolization to hopefully, you know, at least the rationale, to increase responses and thereby improve um, progression-free survival. There have been many um, trials that have actually taken that preclinical rationale and tested that um, in large clinical trials. Um, the, the SPACE trial um, here several years ago being one of, one of those many trials, TASTE-2 being another. Um, and what we see across these trials is that unfortunately this concept does not sort of bear out when actually evaluated in phase two um, studies. Um, and so um, essentially all of these studies failed to show an improvement in survival. Um, and at this point, I think the concept of using TKIs with chemoembolization unfortunately, um, you know, are not proven and should not be done in clinical practice on a routine basis. 
Of course, as much as we've seen immunotherapy sort of um, you know, revolutionize our approach to systemic therapy, um, we have seen the same um, excitement now diffuse into earlier stages of disease. Um, and so we've now seen the next wave of trials really being uh, the combination of local regional therapy plus immunotherapy. This um, really um, uh, takes, takes account of like the uh, abscopal effect where sometimes you can treat patients with local regional therapy um, and basically by the um, in, induction of antigens, you can actually, even without immunotherapy, um, induce the immune system where you can see responses in untreated tumors. This is typically seen particularly with you know, radiation type of therapy. Um, and the, the thought here is if you combine it with immunotherapy, you may further basically take advantage of the same mechanism and thereby, um, once again, increase responses and improve survival uh, for these patients with local regional disease. There are many ongoing trials of immunotherapy in combination with local regional therapy, um, several of them listed here. Um, I won't go through them and, and read them out, but once again, multiple phase two and phase three studies um, taking a look at, at this combination. Um, I think many of them are, are quite exciting. We do anticipate these data coming out over the next several years. There are several abstracts here at ASCO GI taking a look at some of the early data of the combination of immunotherapy plus local regional therapy. There's one abstract here taking a look at the combination of pembrolizumab in combination with radioembolization in patients um, with uh, uh, HCC. Uh, this, this study basically does show some exciting responses um, taking a look at the combination. So once again, saying um, that this really does support the aspect of taking a look at this combination in large phase three trials. Uh, we see some early data taking a look at the combination of um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, Derva and Tremi in com combination with chemoembolization, showing um, uh, basically tolerability um, in, a, in a small cohort of patients, and once again supporting that these things should be evaluated in these ongoing trials. So going back to our patient, um, who was this patient with NASH cirrhosis, um, once again, um, intermediate stage disease, eight centimeter lesion, two satellite nodules, um, you know, uh, compensated liver disease. Uh, let me ask, um, Rich, how would, how would you treat this patient in, in your setting? Yeah, your I, setting? I think this patient would probably get local regional treatment. I would let, you know, if not in a clinical study, we have uh, the Len Pembro study, for example, because she's in great shape for a study. But with that being said, she's asymptomatic, you know, incidentally found, let them decide why 90 or taste, but local regional. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this patient, once again, does fall, you know, squarely in the local regional therapy space. When you add this, um, you know, when you add the number of lesions and the size, this patient does get close to that 12, depending on the size of those satellite nodules. Um, one could argue that this patient has a poor prognosis, so you could argue maybe, um, you know, systemic therapy or if one has a trial of combination, um, I think this patient is getting close to there, but you could also start with local regional therapy and see the response. I think the key thing, I mean, you talked about transition, is not to treat this patient with local regional therapy, cause this patient to become a child PUB patient, and thereby um, you know, prevent the availability of systemic therapy in the future. Can I add a comment on this patient? Of course. Um, for me, this patient is actually the ideal patient for a neoadjuvant approach, because she's a 45-year-old woman, very healthy, um, it's a single lesion with two satellites. If she had a nice response to local regional therapy, I think she'd be someone that could potentially go to surgery. Yeah, that's, that's a very good um, uh, uh, option as well. If you can treat the satellites, depending on, once again, her tumor biology. I think you know, tumor biology is the king of the land off in terms of um, you know, where these patients go. But if this patient, uh, you know, platelet count was sufficient, et cetera, you could then, with unifocal disease, depending on location, try to... Or, try or to transplant, stage. even more likely, right? You know, and, and that's, it's self-serving for all of us to say, but these patients should be evaluated at least once at a large center, because the rules for transplant are variable, they're changing. And this is where, like, I think the idea of the BCLC is a, is a very nice concept to start, but it's the type of thing where these, like, HEC management is quite complex, particularly when you start talking about downstaging and trying to get these patients to curative therapy. I mean, Rich, you already mentioned curative therapy is what really gives patients the best long-term survival. And so getting these patients to surgery, if and when possible, is, is the goal of this game. I mean, you know, however you get there. And I think it just highlights what you've published on, which is that all patients with HCC should be seen in multi-clinic because 
You know, it's the art of medicine and the science of medicine where, you know, you, we now realize that it's going to be tools from many of our buckets that are going to be helping these patients. And, you know, we always want to do data-driven practice, but it also, with HCC, with all of these different options, there's so many things to take into account it, with many minds on the patient. You can, you can even just see with the three of us, sometimes we're coming up with different creative approaches. So bringing people to multi, I think, will be the future. Not the future, it's already here, but it's the way that HCC should be practiced. I mean, particularly as you come up with combination therapies and stage migration, you know, both right and left, I think this is definitely going to become more and more of an important concept even moving forward. Um, you know, Rich, you already, Rich already presented this slide of the modified BCLC staging system, but it really does, once again, nicely highlight now that BCLC stage B is heterogeneous in nature and not all patients should be treated the same. And so for those patients with earlier BCLC stage B, one should consider downstaging. For those patients on the more advanced BCLC stage B, one can consider either systemic therapy or the combination of um, uh, systemic therapy and locational therapy as part of a clinical trial. For the last um, you know, couple minutes of, of my presentation, I want to now move into the earlier stages of disease, so early stage disease and resectable HCC, which often is not included in these um, larger discussions. This patient um, is a 62-year-old uh, male with uh, chronic Hep B, compensated cirrhosis on um, hepatitis B treatment, um, and he's um, uh, undergoing HCC surveillance. And once again, mentioned early in, in the presentation, that HCC surveillance is critical so we can find as many of these patients as early as possible. He has a five centimeter LR5 lesion, uh, so definite HCC, good liver function, platelet count 200, so compensated, no significant portal hypertension. Um, and so this patient would be resectable. Once again, he falls squarely in um, early stage disease and squarely within our resection guidelines, no matter how you cut them. Um, I think that there are now data to become more and more aggressive with this. And so, um, you know, at least the European guidelines have already gone this way. The U.S. guidelines are now going this way, where even patients with some degree of portal hypertension, maybe platelet count 90 to 100, if you're having a very small resection, particularly if you can do it robotically or lap laparoscopically, you can even resect people who aren't traditionally resectable. We know that this offers very good five-year survival um, of around 70% as long as that patient is compensated and once again you're able to leave a good future liver remnant um, of at least 40% in patients with cirrhosis. The issue is recurrence. So the recurrence rate can be as high as 70% um, at five years and unfortunately at this time we don't have any proven adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. Going back to our patient, this patient does undergo a robotic liver resection without complication, but on pathology is found to have a microvascular invasion, poorly differentiated HCC, and so is high risk for recurrence. And so, Lipica, can I ask you, what would you do in this patient um, for who's high risk of recurrence? Um, we'd think about a clinical trial for this patient. Yeah. There are different kinds of adjuvant trials, and I'm sure you're gonna talk about them next, but we'd certainly think about a clinical trial. Yeah, I think this is really one of the exciting areas given this high risk of recurrence. We know that this patient is high risk because of the poor differentiation um, and the microvascular invasion. Once again, starting with TKIs, unfortunately the STORM trial, taking a look at the combination of serafinib after, uh, sorry, serafinib after high risk resection, failed to show a benefit in terms of reducing uh, uh, recurrence or improving survival. There are multiple ongoing phase three studies taking a look at adjuvant immunotherapy, as you can see outlined here, many of them exciting. Uh, and there are neoadjuvant studies that show high responses um, uh, um, in early neoadjuvant studies, and once again, now ongoing um, studies taking a look at this to see if this can also um, improve downstream outcomes like recurrence, free survival, or overall survival. The other interesting thing in terms of, and this is one of my last slides here, the, one of the last things um, in terms of being exciting or being controversial here is how do we um, mix this with liver transplantation? Obviously, we know that immune checkpoint inhibitors can induce graft rejection, particularly if they're given post-transplant. I think all of us are trying to figure out when is it safe to give it um, pre-transplant or if somebody receives immune checkpoint inhibitors and they are downstaged, when is it safe to transplant? There's actually an ongoing study in terms of taking a look at the combination of dervalumab and tremolimab for um, patients listed for liver transplantation with HCC, primary endpoint being cellular rejection. I think this will be a very informative trial for, for us as we move forward. 
And finally, you've already heard this multiple times throughout the presentation, but really um, the, the benefits of multidisciplinary care cannot be uh, understated. There are multiple studies that show that this is not only a feel-good concept, but actually improves curative treatment receipt, improves overall survival. And I think, you know, you've already heard us all say this, but I think that these data really do suggest that this should be standard of care for, for patients with HCC. Um, with that, I'll um, uh, conclude, uh, and I'll leave time for questions. Thank, thank you very much, Amit. Uh, so there's a ton of questions here. Uh, some I think we answered. Uh, I.O. before liver transplant, I think you need to approach that with extreme caution. Also after transplant. Studies have shown that uh, it increases toxicity and uh, it should be avoided, I think, outside of a clinical trial. Um, yeah, Rich, can I just say one thing there? So yes. post-transplant, I think, should be avoided completely. 50% yeah. so graft loss, 25% death. So 100% should be avoided post-transplant. Pre-transplant, I think many transplant centers have now come up with a washout period. I think most transplant centers now have a washout period of around three months. There are Mount Sinai data um, showing single agent, um, I believe nivolumab in that study was the main um, agent, and they actually showed that patients in the short term do well, they do fine. But I think it requires a careful discussion with the transplant center, um, and I think many centers have different washout periods, and some centers won't transplant at all. And I, I guess the question, why would they get I.O., right? These, these are generally patients who couldn't be managed local regionally, but that's a bigger discussion. What were the differences in eligibility between Embrave 150 and Himalaya? Uh, they were pretty much very similar. Different study designs, Embrave 2 to 1, Himalaya I think was 1 to 1. Embrave obviously required the upper endoscopies. I don't think that was required for Himalaya. Really, when we see Himalaya, we'll want to just look at the baseline characteristics of the patients and, and see how that affects things. Severe proteinuria with BEV, what do you do? You know, what's severe, right? Uh, <laughs> typically, uh, if we're talking nephrotic, right, and that's over three and a half grams, I, I think you're compelled to stop. Uh, often patients get a dip, get a spot urine creatinine ratio. Uh, I think if you have to stop BEV, and maybe this is the point of the question, it's maybe not unreasonable just to continue atezolizumab until progression if they're already benefiting. Uh, Amit, you have a patient with active hep B or hep C. Can you uh, treat them while they get IO? Yeah, so the patient with hepatitis B should be treated, um, you know, uh, going into systemic therapy. The patient with hepatitis C does not need to be treated prior to systemic therapy. Um, what I would do is, as we've seen improvements in overall survival with systemic therapy, I would start them on the IO, check their response. Um, if they have stable disease to, um, to respo or a response, Presumably, their overall survival is going to be long enough that they may receive a benefit to treating the hep C, and I would treat at that time. Maitesh, you have someone who has autoimmune disease, right? How, how does that factor into your choice for frontline therapy and IO? Uh, <clears throat> these are patients where you might be wary of using uh, immunotherapies <clears throat> like uh, atezolizumab or duralumab and tremolimumab upcoming, uh, and where you may be sort of uh, more inclined to use things like serafinib or lenvatinib and the other TKIs. With that being said, I think as uh, studies are ongoing and maybe all autoimmune diseases are not equal and you may be able to use some of the immunotherapies there too. So some of these we've answered, I think, in the context, but this is provocative. You know, all this great progress, we're all very excited, but this person says they're not curative, right? Lipica, what are your thoughts? Not curative. It's true. I would say that a lot of these therapies, there's a small percentage of patients that have complete responses, and those are really nice because they often last for a long time, and some of them are cured. The people who have partial responses, also many of them are for a long time. I think the truth is, in GI oncology, we don't end up curing a lot of our patients. Um, we're all working towards that. We're all working towards therapies that increase cure for our patients. Um, I think being able to provide people hope and prolong their survival and help them have more landmark events with their families is certainly progress. I think we have to always keep pushing for cure, and I think that's why being creative with patients who um, may not initially appear curative, thinking about how we can all work together with our colleagues in interventional radiology and radiation 
and surgery to think about how we can get people to cure. And the transplant field has really been pushing to expand criteria to be more liberal about um, being able to cure patients. Um, so I think we're, we're all working towards getting there. But as a GI oncologist, I think keeping optimism for where we're going is helpful and translating that to our patients. And the tail of that curve is rising, right? From serafinib to LEN to now the doublet IOs. And all of us who have used these agents see people who appear to be cured. I mean, and it's been exciting to work on all that. Thank you guys for being here. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VMC 860. This activity is supported by independent medical education grants from AstraZeneca, Azi Incorporated, Exelixis Incorporated, Genentech, a member of the Roche Group, Merck and Company Incorporated, and Novocure Incorporated.